All right, so I'll, I'll talk to you, as Bruno said, a little bit about the existing work and then about some future work um, that we would like to do to try to understand consciousness. So first of all, um, just following what uh, uh, Jerry Edelman mentioned this point briefly, one has to distinguish when studying consciousness two different uh, concepts of consciousness. One is the, di the different states of consciousness, like... Right now, you're still, nobody's asleep, at least not yet, so you're all awake, so that's one state. When you're asleep, you're in a different state. When you're dreaming, you're conscious, but yet again, a different state. And the state of consciousness that you have when you dream is quite distinct from the state of consciousness in that when you're awake. So, for instance, you don't have long term, you don't have access, to, you, could, you don't transfer things from short into long term memory, you don't have access to, uh, you don't introspect, etc. Um, and then, of course, the clinical relevant states like MCS minimal conscious state and PBS uh, persistent vegetative state like Terry Schiavo. You remember her case, terrible sad case last year. So those are different, um, different states. And this usage of states a little bit like, uh, like in states of matter, you know, gas states and plasma states and, and liquid states. And here there are certain neuronal factors that people are interested in, particularly from a clinical point of view. Those involve uh, structures in the, um, in the, in the midbrain, in the midline thalamic nucleus, for example, the interlaminal nucleus. These are responsible. You have to have certain enabling agents. And if they are not present, you may be in coma or you may be in deep sleep. So you're not conscious at all. Most of the research that's ongoing concerns itself with the content of the current state of consciousness. So right now, your state of consciousness should be filled either by my voice with its Teutonic overtones, or it should be filled, it should be filled with, by, by, by the yellow writing or by the content of what I'm saying. And if, you know, if suddenly you remember, oh, darn it, tomorrow there's a grand, de a grand deadline, then your content of your current conscious state will shift towards you know, and remembering what you have to do in order to, 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 to make that, uh, that deadline. This is much easier to study than this experimentally. This we can, man we can manipulate now with, ve with very high precision, uh, both temporal precision, fraction of a second, as well as a fraction of a degree of, of, um, of visual angle. Well, this is much more difficult to, mo to modulate precisely. Yes, it's true, each night we go into different states of consciousness as we, as we go normally from awake into sleep in different states of sleep. But all sorts of things happen when you go to sleep. You have atonia, you, are, you, you don't move, right? You don't have access to memory. Um, your blood pressure changes, your memory changes, so all sorts, of all sorts of different things change. Well, the advantage of these things here, I'll show you, um, I think at least one illusion, you can, everything else change, everything else remains constant except what you're currently conscious of. All right, well, what is it we can say for sure when it comes to consciousness? Well, uh, we can say it seems to be associated with certain types of complex adaptive networks with massive feedback. There's no evidence that in feedforward networks you will have any conscious sensation. In fact, there's there's quite a bit of evidence to indicate the, the, the contrary, that if you're just in a feed-forward mode of operating, you get what we call a zombie system. You get automatic behaviors with, without any conscious sensation. Now, it's only true that for some systems that are shaped by natural selection, you get consciousness. For instance, your immune system is very complicated, is highly adaptive, can learn things, can remember them for your entire lifetime, but we don't have any, con we don't have any inkling that there, is a, that there is an immune system. It does its work in phenomenological silence, as it were. Down here in our gut, most, well, all of us have on the order of 100 million neurons, and you don't want to know what's going on there, right? <laughs> uh, and in fact, we don't really have access, or we only have exceedingly limited access to what, what's down there in our gut. So why is it that we have access to certain, types of, to certain parts of our brain? Not all. We probably don't have access to the cerebellum. We may not have access to states in the retina. And so the question is, what are the neuronal structures that directly give rise to consciousness? And more specifically, what are the minimal mechanisms in those structures that give rise to, to, to consciousness? We believe many species share certain aspects of consciousness with us. That's not to say that the consciousness is the same. But if you look at dogs and mo monkeys and apes and mice, uh, certainly all mammals, by their behavior, by the similarity of the structure of the nervous system, and by their uh, continuity in evolution, we assume that they're conscious. If I take a little cubic millimeter of a monkey brain, a mouse brain, an elephant brain, and a human brain, nobody except a few new anatomists on the planet can really tell the difference. Yes, they're bigger. But of course, our brain isn't the biggest. That's, you know, whales and dolphins. Uh, but otherwise, if you just look at the hardware itself, it's, it's remarkable similar. And of course, we have the problem that philosophers call the first person uh, account. I don't even know whether you're conscious, right? You could all be zombies. Now, I assume, I'm not a solipsist, I assume that, A, because it would be exceedingly unlikely on probabilistic ground that I would be the only person who's conscious. But more to the point is, I know because your behavior is so similar to me, because your brain is almost identical to mine, because we're all very closely evolutionary related, that you have the same internal states that I have. And you can make the same argument with um, other creatures, monkeys, you know, they don't quite look like us, they don't talk. But of course, babies don't talk. 
a fetus doesn't talk, a young baby that's in pain doesn't talk, and a, a man who's, you know, a patient who's, in, who's uh, had a stroke doesn't talk, yet uh, these other systems, organisms, you know, the baby or the fetus or the, um, or the, uh, the, the patient, we still assume has certain, has, still has conscious states. Um, so, so, so from a, bi uh, from a uh, biological point of view, it makes a great deal of uh, sense to assume that at least all mammals, maybe other animals as well, it's very difficult to tell. As you get for, further and further removed evolutionary from humans, it's more difficult to make these arguments by, by analogy. So we don't know, we have, just, we have no idea, I mean people don't talk about this, but we have no idea what the minimal complexity is of a brain necessary for there to be consciousness. And so this is what Francis, um, Francis Crick and I have been advocating since many years, to focus to, fo to focus specifically on, the, on what we call the neural correlates of consciousness, what are the, the minimal mechanisms that are jointly necessary for anyone, um, um, that are um, um, that necessary for, for any specific conscious content, like seeing blue or smelling mom's apple pie. So we, we tend to emphasize, um, uh, we tend to emphasize local, prop um, local properties. Of, um, of, uh, of neural circuits without neglecting what, 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 what um, Jerry Ilman and Tononi emphasized, the, um, the dynamic core, the, the, the more global aspects of, of consciousness. And I'll come back to that in my very last slide. So what's the experimental program? This is, consciousness is not so much a philosophical problem anymore. It used to be one purely. But, but it's, it's now, um, as, as, as John Solis emphasized, it's now becoming more and more a purely empirical problem. So one thing we need, just like a Turing test, we need a Turing test for consciousness. Because, of course, there's no direct relationship between intelligence and, and, and consciousness. We need an assay. We need a battery of tests that we can use in patients, in babies, in fetuses, in monkeys, in mice, in bugs, in flies, in, in C. elegans, in, in drosophila. We need behaviors that require consciousness. And finally, what we need is really a principled... Everything I've talked about is sort of more an opportunistic approach. Ultimately, you need a, a principal theory of consciousness. We want to understand, what, uh, you know, under what condition is what system artificial or natural conscious? When is the Internet conscious? Is the Macintosh already conscious but not telling me? And so what we really need is a principal theory of consciousness in the fullness of time. And the only candidate I, I see right now is the one that, that, that Jerry Edelman and Julio Tononi are looking. I'm, I'm not sure this is the final thing, but the direction they're going in terms of information, you know, integration, differentiation seems to be, to me at least, a very, very promising one. A uh, very exciting talk, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, in the last slide, uh, you mentioned one theory of consciousness, uh, which is uh, Edelman and Tonone, and if you can elaborate a little bit of what you would like to see in a theory of consciousness, or what kind of theory of consciousness would be helpful for understanding or for experiment? Well, I mean, ultimately, a reductionist theory that explains uh, that... that you see, people always say, well, we, there isn't a lot of facts about consciousness. But, you know, you can write a textbook of everything we know about consciousness and how it interferes and how, what goes on in patients and in animals and prosopagnosia and, and cataconia and all these states. So you want a theory that ultimately explains all of those things and that, that, that fundamentally explains, I mean, the central dilemma. And I, and I think, well, I mean, I should really let Jerry talk about it, you know, that explains why that, that certain physical system of a certain type have... Have, have these very rich states that are both integrated as well as highly differentiated. And, and I, th I, I think, the, the, for my money, this is the most promising theory we have right now. Um, and it, it, it's independent of the hardware. So it says, you know, at some point the Internet will, uh, could also become uh, uh, conscious. So it, it's, it's not just a theory like a dual aspect theory like, like David Sharma. So in his ap appendix of his, of his PhD thesis, He's, he's, he's very sympathetic toward dual aspect theories of consciousness. In other words, where you say, well, there's the objective aspect of reality, of information you can measure in Shannon, but then there's the subjective. But he doesn't specify what sort of architecture. You know, I mean, it has a light switch. You know, he would say this also has consciousness, right? Now, that's not very appealing. I want something that's a little bit more quantitative that tells me, well, why is this remote uh, microphone um, amplifier? Is it conscious or why is it not conscious? And how could I test it? So you want a theory, you want a theory like that. And I think they, yeah. For, for my money, it's a, it's a very promising, it's the most promising approach we have. You mean, if I understand, maybe, maybe I should ask that later Jerry, in, the, yes. in the panel, but um, it, so they provide some very nice uh, explanation in graph theory terms of, of the integration about uh, the difference. So according to such a theory, every model or every graph that has this structure will be conscious? I, I, what? I, yes, I think so. Yes. <laughs> 